I'm giving a reading of the two Babylons where the palpable worship proved to be the worship of Nimrod and his wife by the Reverend Alexander Hustock. Um, first uh, published in 1916. And part of the note by the editor um, explains uh, a little bit of the character of the book. It says, but it is deplorable to think that, notwithstanding all the revelations made from time to time of the true character and origin of popery, ritualism still makes progress in the churches, and that men of, of the highest influence in the state are so infatuated as to seek to strengthen their political position by giving countenance to a system of idolatry. If Britons would preserve their freedom and their preeminence among the nations, they should never forget the divine declaration them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Um, starting from chapter 1. The distinctive character of the two systems. In leading proof of the Babylonian character of the palpable church, the first point to which I solicit the reader's attention is the character of mystery which attaches alike to the modern Roman and the ancient Babylonian systems. The gigantic system of moral corruption and idolatry described in this passage under the emblem of a woman with a golden cup in her hand, Revelation 17, for making all nations drunk with the wine of her fornication, Revelation 17, 2 and 18, 3, is divinely called Mystery Babylon the Great, Revelation 17, 5, that Paul's mystery of iniquity is described in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, has its counterpart in the Church of Rome. No man of candid mind who has carefully examined the subject can easily doubt. Such was the impression made by that account on the mind of the great Sir Matthew Hale, no mean judge of, e of evidence, <coughs> that he used to say that if the apostolic description were inserted in the mind of, were inserted in the public hue and cry, any constable in the realm would be warranted in seizing, wherever he found him, the bishop of Rome as the head of that mystery of iniquity, and that would have been their public paper, the hue and cry. Now, as the system here described is equally characterized by the name of mystery, it may be presumed that both passages refer to the same system. But the language applied to the New Testament Babylon, as the reader cannot fail to see, naturally leads us back to the Babylon of the ancient world. As the apocalyptic woman has in her hand a cup wherewith she intoxicates the nations, so was it with the Babylon of old. Of that Babylon, while in all its glory, the Lord thus spake, in denouncing its doom by the prophet Jeremiah, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Jeremiah 9, 7. Why this exact similarity of language in regard to the two systems? The natural inference surely is that the one stands to the other in the relation of type and antitype. Now, as the Babylon of the Apocalypse is characterized by the name of mystery, so the grand distinguishing feature of the ancient Babylonian system was the Chaldean mysteries that formed so essential a part of that system. And to these mysteries, the very language of the Hebrew prophet, symbolic although of course it is, distinctly alludes when he speaks of Babylon as a golden cup. To drink of mysterious beverages, says Salverde, was indispensable on the part of all who saw initiation in these mysteries. Isibi Salverde, De Sciences Occultes, page 259. These mysterious beverages were composed of wine, honey, water, and flour. Giblin Monte Primitif, volume 4, page 319. From the ingredients of Auli, used, and from the nature of others, not avowed, but certainly used. See Silverte, pages 258-259. There can be no doubt that they were of an intoxicating nature, until the aspirants had come under their power, till their understandings had been dimmed, and their passions excited by the medicated draught, they were not duly prepared for what they were either to hear or to see. If it be inquired what was the object and design of these ancient mysteries, it will be found that there was a wonderful analogy between them and that mystery of iniquity, which is embodied in the Church of Rome. 
Their primary object was to introduce privately by little and little under the seal of secrecy and the sanction of an oath what it would not have been safe all at once and openly to propound. The time at which they were instituted proves that this must have been the case. The Chaldean mysteries can be traced up to the days of Semiramis, who lived only a few centuries after the flood, and who is known to have impressed upon them the image of her own depraved and polluted mind. Amianus Marcinellus, compared with Justinus Historia and Eusebius's Chronicle, Eusebius says that Ninus and Semiramis reigned in the time of Abraham. In regard to the age of Semiramis, see further the note on the next page. <laughs> that beautiful but abandoned queen of Babylon was not only herself a paragon of unbridled lust and licentiousness, but in the mysteries which she had a chief hand in forming, she was worshipped as Rhea. Granicon Pescali. and licentiousness would be drunkenness. The great mother of the gods, Hesiod Theogonia, with such a chastity rites as identified with her with Venus, the mother of all impurity, and raised the very city where she had reigned to a bad eminence among the nations as the grand seat at once of idolatry and consecrated prostitution. Herodotus Historia. Thus was the Chaldean queen a fit and remarkable prototype of the woman in the apocalypse, with the golden cup in her hand and the name on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Figure 1. The apocalyptic emblem of the harlot woman with the cup in her hand was even embodied in the symbols of idolatry derived from ancient Babylon as they were exhibited in Greece, for thus was the Greek Venus originally represented. And it is singular that in our own day, and so far as appears for the first time, the Roman Church has actually taken this very symbol as her own chosen emblem. In 1825, on the occasion of the Jubilee, Pope Leo the twelfth struck a medal bearing on the one side his own image and on the other that of the Church of Rome symbolizes a woman holding in her left hand a cross and in her right a cup with the legend around her set it super universum. The whole world is her seat. Eliot's horse volume four page thirty. Year two. Now the period when Semiramis lived, a period when the patriarchal faith was still fresh in the minds of men, when Sem was still alive. For the age of Sem, see Genesis 11, 10, Eleven. According to this, Sem lived 502 years after the flood, that is, according to the Hebrew chronology, till B.C. 1846. <clears throat> the age of Ninus, the husband of Semiramis, as stated in a former note, according to Eusebius, synchronized with that of Abraham, who was born before Christ, 1996. It was only about nine years, however, before the end of the reign of Ninus, that the birth of Abraham is said to have taken place. Senseless, page 170, Paris, 1652. Consequently, on this view, the reign of Ninus must have terminated, according to the usual, usual chronology, about before Christ, 1987. Clinton, who is of high authority in chronology, places the reign of Ninus somewhere, somewhat earlier. In his Fasti Halinici, volume 1, page 263, he makes his age to have been before Christ, 2182. Laird in his Nineveh and its remains, volume 2, page 217, subscribes to this opinion. Semiramis is said to have survived her husband 42 years since uh, 96. Whatever view, therefore, be adopted in regard to the age of Ninus, 
whether that of Eusebius or that at which Clinton and Laird have arrived, it is evident that Sam long survived both Ennis and his wife. Of course, this argument proceeds on the supposition of the correctness of the Hebrew chronology. For conclusive evidence on that subject, see Appendix Note B. To rouse the minds of the faithful to rally around the banner for the truth and cause of God made it hazardous all at once and publicly to set up such a system as was inaugurated by the Babylonian queen. We know from the statements in Job that among patriarchal tribes that had nothing whatever to do with Mosaic institutions but which adhered to the pure faith of the patriarchs' idolatry in any shape was held to be a crime to be visited with signal and summary punishment on the heads of those who practice it. If I beheld the sun, said Job, when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart has been, been secretly enticed, and <clears throat> that which have I, which have I, and that which I have rendered, and is in the authorized version, or, but there is no reason for such a rendering, for the word in the original is the very same as that which connects the previous clause, and my heart, etc. My mouth hath kissed my hand. This also were an inquiry to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. Job 31, 26-28 Now if this was the case in Job's day, much more must it have been the case at the earlier period when the mysteries were instituted. It was a matter, therefore, of necessity. If idolatry were to be brought in, and especially such foul idolatry as the Babylonian system contained, even contained in its bosom, that it should be done stealthily and in secret. It will be seen by and by what cogent reason there was, in point of fact, for the profoundest secrecy in the matter. See chapter 2. Even though introduced by the hand of power, it might have produced a revulsion, and violent attempts might have been made by the uncorrupted portion of mankind to put it down, and at all events, if it had appeared at once in all its hideousness, it would have alarmed the consciousnesses of men <clears throat> and defeated the very object in view. That object was to bind all mankind in blind and absolute submission to a hierarchy entirely dependent on the sovereigns of Babylon. In the carrying out of this scheme, all knowledge, sacred and profane, came to be monopolized by the priesthood. The sciences of cultures passing. Who dealt it out to those who were initiated in the mysteries, exactly as they saw fit, according as the, as the interests of the grand system of spiritual despotism they had to administer might seem to require. Thus the people, wherever the Babylonian system spread, were bound neck and heel to the priests. The priests were the only depositories of religious knowledge. They only had the true, true tradition by which the writs and symbols of the public religion could be interpreted, and without blind and implicit submission to them, what was necessary for salvation could not be known. Now compare this with the early history of the papacy and with its spirit and modus operandi throughout, and how exact was the coincidence? <clears throat> Was it in a period of patriarchal light that the corrupt system of the Babylonian mysteries began? It was in a period of still greater light that that unholy and unscriptural system commenced that has found such rank development in the Church of Rome. It began in the very age of the Apostles when the primitive Church was in its flower, when the glorious fruits of Pentecost were everywhere to be seen, when martyrs were sealing their testimony for the truth with their blood, even then, when the gospel shone so brightly that the Spirit of God bore this clear and distinct testimony by Paul, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 